This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. All right, so welcome to week five uh, of systems analysis. So this week we're um, looking at identifying user stories and use cases. Um, I've also put up next week's material as well, so you've got a couple of weeks worth to keep me going um, before we have the mid-study period break. So we'll be looking at user stories and use cases, a um, couple of different techniques for obtaining information in order to create your use cases, one of those being the user goal technique, um, the other one being the event decomposition technique. We'll also have a look at the RMO scenario within the textbook. Um, and we'll also have a look at um, some of the use cases that have been identified for certain subsystems within the RMO case. All right, so I'll give you some real life examples of what use cases look like. In terms of the lecture content, um, I've got a couple of videos. I'll probably um, show the use case diagrams one. I'll see how I go for timing. But hopefully you've all had a chance to read the slides beforehand, and hopefully you've all had a chance to look at the videos before coming into class. Um, I always say it's, it's good to listen or watch a video more than once because generally the first time you sort of gloss over it and think, oh, okay, that's something new. But the more you watch something, you generally tend to find an additional aspect or an additional point that you didn't pick up the first time. Okay, so putting up these videos is really good for consolidating your learning and clarifying any um, concepts that you're not really sure of. Uh, revision, again, I've got a crossword up there for your uh, revision material following the tutorial and following what we've done this week. Again, to recap your learning, okay? It's, it's for your benefit to make sure that you, you're constantly engaging yourself and immersing, your, immersing yourself in the content by, you know, repeating certain things, okay? So we've got the lecture, we've got the tute, we've got the revision activities, always following up on things that we're doing in class. In terms of assessment material for this week, uh, hopefully you've all at least read the assignment specs if you haven't started working on it. So I, I suggest if you haven't, you put that in your to-do list for this weekend to start working on the assignment because it's due when? 10th, which is a Sunday. What time is it due? 11 p.m. What happens if you submit late? Zero. How do you submit an extension request? Are you, you don't get zero an extension request. It's up on there. It's up there somewhere, yeah. It's up there on the left, right there where it says extensions, okay? So if you need an extension, please ask for one uh, well in advance. Um, yeah. And um, also next week you've got your second quiz, which is due to be done. Uh, the quiz is already... The quiz link is up there, but the quiz is not open. The quiz will be open from Monday. You'll have the entire week to do it. So um, in order to prepare for that, you read chapter two and three to prepare for online quiz, which is due next week. Um, and that's pretty much it for the weekly content. Does anyone have any specific questions about the assignment now that I'm here to answer them at this point in time? Yes, Christian. What's, what's the ideal layout for the actual assignment? I'm just wondering if you want like, question one and then yeah, so Word document, uh, question one, you can probably put the question in bold or whatever, then your answer, then question two, followed by your answer, then question three, followed by your answer. So yeah, just pretty much in the sequence in which it's given in the actual document. Do we need a cover page? Uh, I think UniSA automatically attaches cover sheets and all that kind of stuff to your assignment, so it's not necessary, no. As long as your name is on there, at some point, in case I print them all out to mark them, and you know I don't want it to get lost, so put your name on there somehow. You can just do a header page and put, you know, systems analysis assignment one, and then put your name, due date, whatever. That's fine. Okay. Any other questions? So just a word document, and you can create a PDF. Yes. You've got question? No. No more questions. Any other questions at this point in time? Um, again, as I said, if you do have specific questions, please don't email me directly. Please post your questions on the um, SA Assignment 2 individual Q&A forum. Okay, and that way I can respond to everybody.
Yes. I have a question. Can you make the quizzes come up on that little assessment notification bar at all? No, because they're not... Um, you mean when you log on yeah. to your assessment thing? Well, it comes up when it's due and stuff, because otherwise you have to go into it and I forget. Uh, no, because of the way the quizzes have been set up um, in Learn Online, it's not possible. The actual assessments I can, but the quizzes I can't, because they've been set up in a slightly different, different way. So Sorry. you put that heading up on the beginning of the week in red anyway, don't you, saying that? Like, yeah, so week six, yeah, you've, you've got, got the red reminder, reminder yeah. to that the quiz two, this is next week, I've yeah. got the quiz two to be completed and assignment two is due this week. So um, there's, there's only so much I can do. But I'm assuming you're going on the course website each, each week and checking what has to be done each week anyway. And it's open for the entire week. But yeah, I can't, um, it's a good request, but just the way it's all set up in the background, um, I can't make that one available. Um, having said that, is the assignment one up as a... It is? Okay, cool. I just wanted to check that as well. Um, all right, any other questions at this point in time about the assignment? No? Okay. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting on the assumption that you've all had a, a, a skim or a look through the slides and or you've read the associated chapter with identifying user stories and use cases. So I'm not going to fully play the videos. I might choose to play one or the other. But it's important to realise that we're now starting to think about gathering information and gathering requirements from our users in relation to a particular system that needs to be developed. So we need to start thinking about how we gather requirements. What do we do when we gather requirements? So we need to think about and understand um, why we need to identify user stories and use cases because they're key really to gathering and defining the functional requirements. I talked about last week functional requirements. What was the other thing I talked about? Functional versus non-functional requirements. What's the difference between the two? Can anyone remember? What's the difference between functional and non-functional requirements? Functional is the requirements, what the system needs to do in terms of business processes. I'm repeating this for the benefit of people listening to the recording. Non-functional requirements. Everything else. Everything else. Paul says everything else. What do we mean by... Give me some examples of what we mean by everything else. Uptime. Sorry? Uptime. Uptime? Availability. Availability. Okay, so... When does the system have to be available? How long does it have to be available? The reliability of the system? A couple of other examples? Usability, security. Usability, security, performance, okay? Nothing to do with actually the functions you've got within the system, but they are still just as important, okay? However, we're not interested in the non-functional aspects when we're looking at user stories and use cases. This is key and essential to helping us define what the functional requirements are. What are the business process invo processes involved? What does the system actually have to do? Um, we then write user stories with acceptance criteria, looking at the two use cases, um, and then looking at use case diagrams. Okay, you've got to do a use case diagram as part of your first assignment, um, part of what we did... No, you don't not this assignment, I'm thinking of activity diagram. In the second assignment, you're going to have to do a, a, a use case diagram, but we'll look at the notation and the purpose for doing a use case diagram. So last week we looked at activity diagrams to model and uh, re represent business processes or workflows. You would have had to practice that in this week's tutorial. You'll practice that again um, in your assignment, which is due next week, in terms of activity diagrams. This is now another diagram, a use case diagram which can help us define the functional requirements. And we'll have a look at an example uh, of a use case diagram and how we represent actors and use cases and who is involved in using those use cases based on who the actors are. So again, based on chapter three. So we looked at um, last week, what systems analysis activities, what are the things we need to do. One of those is gathering requirements. We need to establish functional and non-functional requirements. We need to be able to model those requirements using different tools and different techniques and different models, i.e. different types of diagrams. 
and we also looked at different ways of gathering information. Can you remember some of the ways we talked about in terms of how we gather information from selected groups? Questionnaire? Questionnaire? Interviews? Interviews. <coughs> Sorry? Surveys. Surveys? Looking at like systems. Looking at other similar systems? Research. Researching vendor solutions? Observation. Observation. Excellent. Okay, so there are different ways that we can gather the requirements for a system. Okay, the different tools and techniques. Um, so this chapter base is, uh, is focusing on identifying and modelling the key aspects of the functional requirements in terms of diagrams, which we call use cases. <coughs> so in the RMO trade show system in Chapter 1, which you would have had to um, all do as pre-reading to Week 1 or 2, there were some example use cases, i.e. what are the functions that need to be carried out by this particular system. Um, and some of these are listed here. Look up supplier, enter slash update product information, enter slash update contact information. These are things that need to be performed by the RMO trade show system. Let's look at a user story. It's a one sentence description of a work related task done by a user to achieve some sort of goal or result. So we gather a whole bunch of user stories from users to establish what kind of work related tasks are done by those users. We then need to also specify acceptance criteria which determine or identify features that should be present once that task has been completed. So we've got a template here as a whatever I want to do something so that something occurs. So an example, as a shipping clerk or clerk, um, I want to ship an order as accurately as possible as soon as the order details are available. The acceptance criteria, so this is basically what has to happen um, in order for this to be met. I'm not going to play this one. Assuming you've seen it, if you haven't, please do so because it's um, a, a video on strategies on how to identify use cases okay, when, when carrying out interviews or gathering system requirements. So use cases, they do define the functional requirements. Um, a use case is defined as an activity that the system performs and it's usually in response to a request by a user. Okay? Two techniques, user goal and events decomposition techniques and you will get to practice those in next week's tutorial, you will also get to practice um, as part of your group assignment. Each use case um, uses the verb noun technique. Okay, so a strategy for developing and listing your use cases is using the verb slash noun approach. So the user goal technique is the most common one used in industry and it's simple and effective. And it enables you to identify um, potential categories of users of the system. So it's all well and good to figure out the functional requirements, but you need to know who the users are that are involved in performing those functions. Okay, because they're typically the ones that you are going to speak to that are going to know about the functionality or they're going to know about the current way that system performs as well as knowing how they want the improvements to be made on that potential aspect of the system. So you interview and ask them to describe the tasks the computer can help them with. What are the functions that you perform on a daily basis? What are the functions that the system performs? What are the functions you want the system perform to perform for you? So ask them to describe the tasks. Um, and if you can refine the tasks into a specific user goal, that's even better because it gives you the verb noun technique. Ship items, track shipment, create return. Okay, so we've got the verb, the doing word, and then the <coughs> noun, the thing that's being acted upon. So here are some example RMO CSMS users and goals of, of what they want achieved as a result of this particular system. Potential users, we've got a potential customer, marketing manager, and a shipping personnel. And the user goal and the resulting use case are as, fo as possible. And again, you can see it follows the, the verb noun technique. Search for item, fill shopping cart, view product rating and comments, uh, ship items, track shipment, create item return, and so on and so forth. So we need to think about who's using the system, what functions those users want the system to perform. Okay. 
So here are some steps in the user goal technique. Um, and I've, I've listed the steps for both techniques. Again, assuming you've read them and you're quite competent and cap capable of reading. So I'm not going to go through all of these steps. Okay, but it's, it's a mechanism that you can follow when you are interviewing people, when you are gathering functional requirements, when you are defining functional requirements, as well as when you're working on your assignments to establish from a given scenario, what are the use cases that I have? How can I determine what the use cases are? Follow these potential steps and that should help you in your path to coming up with a use case diagram. The event decomposition technique, again, is more comprehensive and complete, and you will get to practice using those techniques as part of next week's tutorial. So looking at these steps and identifying and knowing about them is going to help you um, in leaps and bounds to using those two different types of techniques. The end result is the same. It's just a matter of the starting point is different for each of those two techniques. And there's no right or wrong way. It's just the two different approaches. So the event decomposition techniques basically focuses on an event, which is something that occurs at a specific time and place. It can be described and should be remembered by the system. So here's an example of um, a charge account processing system and some events that occur. Um, external events occur in the actual environment. For example, a customer changes address. So the use case is maintain customer data. Okay. Another external event, a uh, customer makes a charge, so the use case is process a charge. Another example, customer pays bill, that's the event. The associated use case is record a payment. So what happens? What do these actors, what are these customers doing? What is the associated use case or what is the associated function the system must perform in terms of the verb noun technique? We also have things called temporal events that occur inside the system at a particular point in time. Okay, so at the end of the month or whatever, we have time to send out monthly statements. That's something that happens at a particular point in time. It's an event. So the use case or the actual function that the system must perform is produce monthly statements. Time to send late notices. So the use case is send late notices. Time to produce end of week summary reports. So the use case is produce summary reports. Okay, so you can see there's an event, there's something that's happening at a particular point in time and how we've converted that event into a use case by using the verb noun technique. Okay, so there are different types of events that can trigger things or that can cause a system to do certain functions. So I talked about the external event which ha occurs outside the system and it's generally initiated by someone that's using the system. Um, an external agent or an actor is what we refer to as someone outside the system. The temporal event, again, is an event that occurs as a result of reaching a particular point in time, whether it's weekly, whether it's monthly, whether it's fortnightly, something happens at a given point in time. The third type of event is a state event. That's something that happens inside the system um, well, when something happens inside the system, it triggers a process. Okay, so for example, a reorder point is reached for an inventory item. So when a particular stock level is reached, we then send out a signal or we carry out a function to reorder more inventory. Okay, so something happens, it's not necessarily at a specific point in time, but it's something that is a trigger. So you would set up a rule or there would be a rule somewhere within the system to be looking out for something. Once that something occurs, then that function is carried out. Okay, so we've got external, something that's triggered outside by an agent. We've got temporal, something that happens as a result of reaching a point in time. We've got a state event, something that is, happens as a result of a trigger or a flag being um, activated and then some sort of function is carried out. Um, so here's a bit of a checklist for um, to come up with your external events. A customer buys a product, someone wants to know product details, they have a new address and a phone number, um, management wants some information. So there are some triggers or questions that you could perhaps ask yourself when 
either deciding who you need to speak to or when you're deciding what functions the system must perform, ask yourself these questions that are potentially external events. Uh, who wants something in result, uh, resulting in a transaction? Does someone want information? Does someone want things to be updated? Does someone want information in terms of management? Think about it in terms of um, create, amend, update, delete, list, report, all of those things to do with transactions and people and processes. These are the triggers that you need to be thinking about in terms of the functionality of a system. Do I need to create something? Do I need to maintain slash update something? Do I need to delete something? What are those somethings? Do I need to create a report on something? Who needs to receive that report? Why do they need to receive that report? When do they need to receive that report? Okay. Questions that you should be asking and thinking about when trying to determine what are the business processes or what are the functional requirements from this particular scenario. A temporal event checklist, um, internal outputs needed at points in time, um, as well as external outputs needed at points in time. So that gives you some examples of how to think about your temporal events. And here's a, a, a diagram that gives you an example of finding the actual event that affects the system. A couple of examples there. So here are the actual steps. Um, in terms of the event decomposition techniques. So again, specific strategies and techniques for how to A, determine your use cases via the first technique. Um, another one, how to identify your use cases via the event decomposition technique. Okay? Consider the external events, then identify the name and the use case, then you look at your temporal events, do the same thing, then you identify the name and the use case, then you look at your state events. So we look at the three different types of events that can potentially occur uh, within the system that the system may need to respond to. Then for each of those events, you need to think of and identify the name and the use case using the verb noun technique. Benefits, okay? You need to think of the business processes that are involved in a system. And these are some really useful techniques of breaking it down at the granular level to determine what the system should do. What are the business processes? What is the functionality? What activities, what actions must the system perform? And who are the actors that are involved, if any, in carrying out those activities? Are the actors involved or is it a system triggered process? Is it not a system triggered process? Is it a time triggered process that can help you determine whether it's external, temporal, or state in terms of the events? Okay, so great techniques um, to help you determine what your system should look like and what functions the system should be performing. <coughs> Once we kind of figure that out, or while we're gathering our requirements, we need to think about. Um, not only coming up with a list of use cases, okay, so I've given you some techniques, two different types of techniques to come up with your use cases using the verb noun technique. So we now know, potentially, we have a list of the functions that the system must perform, the functional requirements. Fantastic, well and good, it's great to have a list of functions. But you need to be able to elaborate on that information. Why do you think it's important to be able to elaborate on this information? Two different people might think that uh, 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 um, something with a, a, an action and a, and a, and a noun, um, people might think of it in different ways. Right? Yes, I mean, your interpretation of look up customer might be completely different to my interpretation of look up customer versus your interpretation of look up customer. And in reality, we could all be wrong of what we mean by look up customer. So, Yes, we've identified as a first point what are the functional requirements, i.e. what are the use cases in the verb noun technique, but you need to next provide a, a brief use case description. Okay? In determining what you put in that use case description, you kind of don't have to give an essay. Okay? It's pretty much uh, a one, sent one or two sentence description showing the main steps, but you are also identifying who the actor is, or specifying that the user actor does whatever they need to do. Okay, so in this case for create customer account, 
The brief use case description is user actor enters new customer account data and the system assigns account number, creates a customer record and creates an account record. So what is the user slash actor doing? As a result of that, what is the system then doing? As a result of that, what is the status of the system as a result of that having been performed? So the user is entering data, the system assigns an account number, it creates a customer record and creates an account record. Look up customer. The user actor enters a customer account number, so that's what's triggering this particular function. But the system responds by retrieving and displaying customer and account data. So we're talking about it from two sides of the coin. How is the user involved in this use case? What is the system doing in response to or to facilitate this use case being carried out or this function being carried out? Here are some examples for the RMO CSMS project um, of use cases. Now, there are certain subsystems in this particular system. This one is the sales subsystem, gives you a list of use cases. So these are the functional requirements for the sales subsystem. Here is a brief description of only the customers or the actors, okay? This is different to this here. This gives us the use case and a brief description of the use case. This gives us the use case and the users and the actors that are involved in engaging with or interacting with this use case. Similarly, we've got the order fulfillment system, use cases and actors, and all of the other systems. So different types of information being displayed for various reasons. So let's just have a quick look at the video on use case diagrams. To give you an appreciation for what um, happens, why they're created and what they look like. As we've discussed many times, it's important to have models of important system components. And uh, a use case diagram is a very important model that shows end users and other stakeholders what are the use cases and who are the actors within the new system. It's a very basic uh, diagram that can be very useful in presentations and for other forms of documentation. The use case diagram is a UML model, Unified Modeling Language Model, as used to graphically show use cases and the relationships to all the actors that might use the use cases. Now remember, Unified Modeling Language is a standard for diagramming uh, in information systems. In uh, UML, an actor is what's called a, an end user, and so we have actors on use case diagrams. And then there's also an automation boundary. The diagram shows the boundary between the actor being a human end user and the computerized portion of the application. This is a very simple use case diagram showing one actor here as a stick figure. This is the uh, standard symbol in UML for an actor. And then there's one use case, ship items, again name, verb, noun, and we identified this uh, use case when we were using uh, techniques to identify use cases for the system. And there's a connecting line between the actor and the use case, implying that this actor participates in this use case. This actor is the user in this use case. Now there can be more than one actor that's involved with uh, a particular use case. The automation boundary is shown as a uh, box around all of the use cases. And by automation boundary, we mean that everything inside of this box is automated. It's software. It's uh, uh, been designed and implemented by us. And everything outside the automation boundary would be uh, a user of the system, an actor of the system that's interacting with the software. Now remember, in basic information systems terminology, an information system includes both the users and the software they're using to carry out tasks. So the system boundary is different from the automation boundary. This is an example of a use case diagram for a subsystem. 
And this particular use case diagram is showing all of the actors that are involved in use cases of this subsystem. So for example, you have create update customer account, uh, request a friend link up, reply to a friend link up, view mountain bucks, browse messages, process account adjustment, send message, transfer mountain bucks, and send receive points. A customer as an actor has been defined as uh, someone who can carry out all of these goals, all of these use cases with our system. Uh, additionally, a customer service representative will be able to create and update a customer account. A store sales representative will be able to create and update a customer account. And management will be allowed to process account adjustments. So this shows that uh, in most cases, the customer is able to do all of these use cases, except, of course, process their own account adjustment. And then other uh, RMO uh, users are able to carry out other functions. So this is a useful way to get together with people on the team or people in end user groups and say, for the customer account subsystem, these are all the actors involved, and this is specifically what they're going to be allowed to do. This is another use case diagram for RMO. In this case, it's the sales subsystem. And rather than including all of the use cases in the sales subsystem, this one's just focusing on use cases that can be carried out by the customer directly. This would be a useful diagram to take to a focus group when we were discussing with uh, potential customers what kinds of things they'd want to be able to do with our uh, RMO system. And we would, we would start out with these and get them to review what we've, what we've included and, and talk about what they'd like to see for each one of these use cases. For example, a customer is going to want to search for an item view product comments and ratings, view accessory combinations, fill the shopping cart, empty the shopping cart, uh, fill a reserve cart, uh, convert a reserve cart to a shopping cart, uh, check out the shopping cart, and empty the reserve cart. So this is an example of one diagram used for one particular type of meeting, one particular type of discussion you might have with end users. Obviously, you could do a lot of different use case diagrams. The key is to, uh, to determine what do I want to show people? What do I need to take to a meeting to discuss with people who are involved as stakeholders in this project in order to discuss use cases and who are the actors involved in use cases? No. Okay, so use case diagrams, UML model, okay, another model. We looked at activity diagrams last week, this week's use case diagrams. Graphically shows the use cases and their relationship to actors. So we've identified the functions of the system using the verb noun technique. By looking at the functions of the system, we then need to identify who are the actors that are actually interacting with those functions in the system. So we can determine functions, we can determine actors, we then have a relationship between the functions and the actors of the system, and we can represent um, the actors using the stick figure, we represent our functions using the oval, we represent the automation boundary, which shows the boundary between the computerized portion of the system and the um, external users of the system or the users who operate the application. So again, the example here, um, as given in the video, and it is actually a really a stick figure. Okay, so some of you may be graphic artists or maybe itching to really draw a real person. It's not the UML convention, so please stick to the the stick figure as provided in the actual particular uh, software and tools that you create. And or if you are doing something by hand um, in your tutes and stuff, please make sure you stick to a, um, a stick figure. So why do you think it's important to have a representation, for example, of a diagram for a subsystem versus a diagram for a single actor such as a customer? Why would we want to represent a use case diagram in potentially two different ways. We might be showing it in two different meetings. You might be showing it in two different meetings. You might have different audiences. 
okay? You may have meetings with customers, for example, um, and you may want to clarify that as a customer, are these actually the things that you're involved in? Or you may have an, uh, a meeting with someone that wants to know what the customers are actually involved in. You may be able to potentially identify something that has been left out in terms of what functionality should be available for customers. For this particular subsystem, we've got the customer account subsystem. These are the actors involved in using that particular aspect of the subsystem. And these are the functions that are involved in the customer account subsystem. So you may want to have a representation for each subsystem and what is the functionality for each of those subsystems because you may have different people developing those different subsystems therefore they need to understand and appreciate what functions need to be provided within that particular subsystem that they are working on. So same diagram, same conventions used but representing different information for a variety of audiences. Now you don't have to create every single diagram. It's all dependent on the system you're creating and who you're creating the system for and what the requirements are that you need to create. But in some form or another, a use case diagram is a great visual representation of the functions and who's involved in using those particular functions. Again, a couple of other um, examples presented here. Another scenario could be where we have a function that calls or has a subroutine another function and the way we represent that um, is through something called the includes relationship. So where one use case is stereotypically included within another use case, again a subroutine, the arrow points to the subroutine. So fill a shopping cart is a function within the system but in order to fill the shopping cart we need to carry out three other functions or use cases. We need to search for item, we need to view product comments and ratings, and we need to view accessory combinations. And each of those in their own right are use cases and separate functions. Okay? It just so happens that the full shopping cart is a culmination or a combination of those three use cases represented using the includes um, relationship. So some steps to creating use case diagrams. Um, again, they will help you with creating your diagrams and forming the diagrams. What do we need to do first? Identify the stakeholders and users. Who are going to benefit in seeing this diagram? As I said, you don't have to create every variation of every diagram. So it's really important to identify who's interested in using and seeing these particular diagrams. Um, who needs to review the diagram? Do we need to think about each subsystem? Do we need to think about each user? Which ones are the use cases that are of interest to those particular stakeholders? Um, select the use cases and the actors and draw the use case diagrams. Again, there are a number of software packages that can be used to draw use case diagrams. It would be the similar type of diagram, sorry, similar type of software that you would be using to create your UML activity diagram, which is part of your assignment and what we talked about last week. Important to name each use case diagrams and I guess note when the diagram should be reviewed with use cases, uh, with, sorry, with users and stakeholders. So not too difficult, but you've got to follow the steps. You've got to look at your two techniques for gathering use cases, for identifying use cases, for representing them, either via the user goal technique or the event decomposition technique. Um, you need to think about getting your user stories and your use cases. So what does the user actually want in terms of the functionality from the system? Once you've identified your use cases using either technique, got some user stories, you need to come up with your use case diagrams. But in addition to that, it's important as part of the diagrams I showed, represent some tables that have your use cases and the actors that use those use cases, have your use cases and provide a brief use case description of what should be happening in that use cases. So who is engaging and interacting with that use case? How do they trigger that use case? What is the system doing in response to that trigger of that actor being doing something with that particular use case. So a brief use case description, 
couple of tables and the use case diagram that shows you um, in, a, in a simple view who the actors are, where the automation boundary lies and what functions are involved in that system, what the functionality is, as well as links to the users that have an interest or are engaging or interacting with those particular functions. Okay. Um, 